I've had a raccoon work on a, um, trying to get into a, a garbage can that I had t- a, as a test for eight hours. Like, okay, a wild raccoon, not in the city, would tries that for like five minutes and is like, look, I got to go. I got things to do. I got to find some food. I can't be wasting my time. Where big fat females just like, all right, you know. Let's just let's just take a look at this thing and she has some time. She's nothing else to do. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back today with somebody I'm excited to talk to because we're gonna talk about animals and we're gonna talk about raccoons. We've got Suzanne McDonald. How you doing? I am awesome. Thank you for asking. <laughs> you sure are. Uh, <laughs> professor of psychology at York University. You have specialized in, in studying uh, animal and animal behavior, animal psychology. Um, you're known for raccoons, but we were just talking about orangutans. How did you get involved in animals in general, but then how? what led you to orangutans? Well, I, I actually did my PhD uh, and master's degree on pigeon behavior. So, um, yeah, it is quite a quite a leap. But when I was a postdoctoral fellow um, at UBC here in Canada and Vancouver, um, I went to the local zoo in Vancouver, which was really sad. And I thought it was very sad. So I went to the director of the zoo and I said, I think your zoo is very sad. Please let me help you with these some of these very sad animals. And he was he still is. He's fantastic. And I, he said, ah, that'd be great. So um, the saddest of the sad animals there were the monkeys. Um, so I did a lot of work with the monkeys there. And then when I got a professor job, I moved to Toronto and I went to the Toronto Zoo and I said, I've been working at the zoo in Vancouver, which was very sad. And everyone said, oh, yes, it's very sad. Um, And it actually isn't there anymore. That's how sad it was. Um, And I said, I will volunteer to do all the things that I did there with your animals here. And so from that day forward, I started working with the gorillas and the orangutans and other species at the zoo and other zoos around the world. So that's how I got into that. It's a weird story. What? But what? When you say working with them, do you you're in there uh, monitoring them, or you go in there and feed them and rub their feet? Or oh, no. <laughs> no, no. Luckily, no. Uh, the zookeepers do a fantastic job of that. No, but um, for twenty over twenty five years, I've been working with orangutans at the Toronto Zoo using a computer with a touch screen, um, so we can ask them questions and they can tell us how they view the world, and it's really fantastic. Our um, orangutan exhibit at the Toronto Zoo is now being expanded to an outdoor exhibit and we're going to include technology in there so we can ask them how they feel about things. We've I've had so many great grad students work with them looking at whether they like music or not and whether what kinds of foods do they prefer and how do they differentiate orangutans from other species, which is very cool if you think about it because they live in the zoo. And they've never seen other species, but yet they can tell you a gorilla versus a chimp versus an orangutan, which is amazing. Um, So things like that, asking them questions that are fun and giving them, it's enriching for them because, you know, they're they're stuck there. (laughs) Uh, So it's really nice to have things to think about. And we actually learn a lot about how uh, their minds work, which is what I'm interested in. What was one of the most surprising realizations where they did they express loneliness or they expressed uh, that they knew that they were st- stuck inside or was no, there anything they're not, really? No, they're not, you know, the other great apes are not very philosophical. So I've, I've known a lot of orangutans in my time, even some that use sign language and they never ever talk and chimpanzees that use sign language as well. And they never talk about stuff like that. They mostly talk about, I'd like some food. Do you have food? Could I have food? Is that food you have in your bag? Will you bring me some food? And uh, would you like to play? So that's pretty much. And that's why I love all of our cousins. We're all very, very, there's so much more fun to work with than humans. Anyway, no, no one's ever (laughs) expressed that. But the most interesting thing, I think, that was surprising. I mean, everything you learn about another animal's mind is surprising. But the fact that um, we gave them the chance to tell us what kinds of music they liked uh, so we played all these different um, types of music. So I thought, like, classic rock. Maybe they'd be really into classic rock. Um, no, but in fact, when you give them the choice, they turn it off. They're like, I prefer nothing. Thank you very much. So, you know, we we had music that sounded more like them. We had music, all different kinds. And, and it, 
without fail, they if you give them the chance to say they don't want to listen to anything, they'd be like, yeah, no, I, I just don't. I just don't. Wow, interesting. Yeah. I would have yeah. guessed. I would. I would have guessed a genre, but yeah, as as a music nerd, though, I'm really curious about: is it the speaker? It's coming through, or did you try live? Because in- acoustic instrumentation can be different than something in a speaker. Absolutely, but- yeah. And I, we didn't try that, but we did. You know, have a variety of speakers, and there's a variety of individuals too. So I thought, you know, we could have one or two who just don't like music, but they were all just like, oh, given the choice, thanks. <laughs> I prefer nothing. So it could be just. That there are other sounds going on that they're more interested in, or they have to they have to pay attention to, or my, whatever. But my, these these orangutans didn't like didn't prefer music. My stepdad was like that too. Just talk radio all the time. I couldn't. I think that uh, absolutely. <laughs> I had you know I I used to work with pigeons, and I would have a TV on for them, like a TV, so they could watch it because it's enriching for them too. And I noticed that they have preferences and they really like soap operas. They really liked it when people were talking to each other constantly um, on a soap opera. And so they would all like gather around <laughs> and watch <laughs> the soap opera. So you, you just never know, right? Like you never know what another species is going to find entertaining. I don't know why, but yeah. I imagine talk radio is entertaining just because it's the sound of voices, which they like. Um, and soap operas are kind of like talk radio for pigeons. So they like that. It was, it was, I didn't expect that. (laughs) Well, there's something comforting about uh, there's other of your kind behind you blobbing on. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it it is relaxing. And especially I think orangutans in the zoo, they hear people all the time. Um, And so maybe they just like to hear people all the time. They don't want to hear singing. No, that's for sure. Nope, nope. No drums, no rhythm, no guitars, please. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, So you also uh, studied turtles. Is that true? Yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, my good former student, postdoc, great colleague now, and I um, study turtles in uh, the Toronto area. Um, he's branched out and, and is studying turtles in Kenya, where we work as well. But um, yeah, it's amazing. So I'm very interested in species that live in close contact with us, either in zoos or in urban areas, and how we can mitigate some of the horrifying things that we do to these poor animals Um, and the horrifying thing we do to turtles is we run them over because they go from one wetland to another that are often bisected by very busy roads and they um, when they're searching for mates or or nesting they will cross that road and they because they're turtles Mm. they're not exactly speed demons and so they get killed thousands and thousands of turtles are killed so um it's been an interesting decade of working with uh, the city and, and regional conservation authorities to try to figure out how we can reduce the carnage, really, um, of these poor turtles getting squashed by cars. Any progress being made to one of these kind of like ramps that go over the road or something like this? Yeah, yeah. So for turtles, the the ramps go under the road because they don't want to climb up over the road. But yeah, I love all the corridors studies and and that are happening all around the world. Yeah, so um, the city of Brampton, actually, here in Ontario, invested a lot of money, like millions of dollars to to put corridors underneath the road. And we have to and fencing to kind of encourage the turtles to use the corridors. Of course, what happens is the raccoons go under the corridors and just wait for the turtles and then have something to eat. Yeah. (laughs) Once again, we're backed into a corner because we're trying to mitigate it with some kind of technology, some kind of human technology, and we're just probably making things worse. Yeah, Uh, well, you know, at least we're trying. (laughs) Yeah, that's the thing. And when I think when politics comes involved and they actually, when somebody cares about something as abstract as biodiversity and it gets passed through in politics, all you can really do is clap because knowing how stupid humans are, we should just be happy that some progress... (laughs) <laughs> and it's amazing. I just find it amazing when people, you know, we have this amazing citizen science group that monitors the turtles and watches for them on the road. And, you know, we're talking dozens and well, actually hundreds of people who are out there. And so there are really good humans in the world. And those are the ones you want to associate with, really. And you can't go onto Twitter because Twitter just makes you think everything is terrible and the world is on fire. But when you are actually speaking to people who are passionate about it, you know, you see yeah. that there's lots of people who share the view that we need to do something. And there's a surprising number of politicians who feel the same way, which is great and 
startling. Yeah, at the same time. But you said mm -hmm. a mouthful when it comes to Twitter. I was just on it today just thinking, what kind of dystopian <laughs> hellhole am I living in right now? And why is fascism so appealing to everybody? Well, and but you can't do it because it's not reality, right? It's its, its own little world and you get this bipolar fanaticism on both sides. And it's not, it's not reality. Most people are. You know, not most people, but there's a lot of people out there who are amazing, and they're not on Twitter. Not so. yeah, not thank God, but uh, there, but there must. You're a psychologist in the way that you could say there's some kind of reason that we are uh, gravitate towards reactionary style stuff. That's well, I, I think it is a knee jerk reaction thing, right? Like if somebody says something outrageous, they're going to get all of the views, they're going to get all the comments, they're going to get all, you know, if you really just want a reaction, then say something stupid on Twitter and you'll get 100. <laughs> if you say, oh, the world is wonderful, here's a flower, no one's going to even read, look at it. So, you know, you really have to do something. I, I occasionally post pictures of raccoons who want hugs or something just because I feel like, please, Twitter, have something pretty and nice and lovely. <laughs> but generally, it's just a small. Yeah. And that makes it so my whole uh, attempt here to try to put something like that out there is probably, you know, nobody's going to watch this because it's just about something as boring as raccoons, which or, you know, for me, that's the fruit of life. And I, I'll take... Um, real discussions with real scientists over reactionary stuff any day so i think so and yeah I, but you know i get it occasionally i i mean i go on twitter once a day I, I admit it and i get outraged and maybe i want to be outraged maybe that's why i do it i don't know it definitely gets my blood pressure to a point it hasn't been the whole day and so i feel a bit alive in that yeah it's kind of like exercise really it's like you know sure. yeah yeah, yeah. But by the evening time, I've got a nice glass of scotch or a nice glass of gin. I'm just <laughs> raring to go. Um, so what? So you went and studied all these animals, and then you landed on the raccoon, and it became like the famous raccoon lady. What <laughs> What happened? How did that happen? Oh, it was a weird experience because I, um, we have this. Uh, we have a national broadcasting company here in Canada called CBC Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and. It's a public broadcasting company, and um, they were doing a co-production with PBS, which is the American uh, Public Broadcasting, and they wanted to. They were doing it on raccoons, and so the producer of the and this was years ago. She contacted me, and she's like, "Nobody studies raccoons. I know you study other animals. Could you come on camera and talk about raccoons?" And I'm like, "Well, I could, but I would totally be making it up because I don't know. Nobody knows anything about raccoons." And she's like, "Well." Could we learn about raccoons? I'm like, all right. So we bought some collars to put on raccoons, and we followed raccoons for several years because this thing took years to make. Um, and we learned a little bit about raccoons. It was amazing. And so then when I could talk on camera, I could actually say, hey, I have some data because I'm not going to just talk about nothing. Um, and since then, it's sort of like, well, they're in my backyard. I might as well study them instead of having to fly to Kenya all the time. I might as well just learn a little bit about raccoons in the backyard. So that's what? how it's. Were you surprised or, or, or taken back by some of the stuff that you found out as you were going along, how cute they are, how smart they are? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I assume they were smarter than they are. They're not actually that smart. Um, and <laughs> they are darn cute. Um, they're, you know, they're pretty... You don't want them in your house. As I know lots of Americans have them in their houses and they make TikTok videos and I get that. But an av the average raccoon is very bitey. They, they have very big teeth. They have claws. They carry all sorts of diseases. You know, you don't, you don't, you can look at them from afar and be amazed at how adorable they are and how they can adapt to our environment, which is what I'm interested in them and why I think they're heroes that they can live so well with us. Um, but, you know, I going into it, I assumed they would be smarter than they are. Um, I assumed they would be like primates. North America has no primates. I assumed they would be like monkeys because I've been studying a lot of monkeys and, and great apes. And I assumed they would fill that niche and have the same kinds of intelligence that those that our cousins do. Um, but they don't. Um, they're wildly different. They're not. Um, they don't sit and puzzle through a, a problem. They just smash it. They just want to break things. They just 
want to knock things over. They just, they don't re they're not sitting there reasoning through things like primates do. So, you know, we may. Well, I know people like that. So it's well, for sure. And <laughs> I, I mean, I work with gorillas for the decades and gorillas are a lot like that too. If they, if you give them a, a problem to solve, they will just, you know, their first instinct is to just break it open. Why wouldn't you? You're incredibly strong. Break it open. That makes perfect sense. But raccoons are like, they have impulse control issues. As a psychologist, I can tell you that. They don't, you know, if they see a piece of food, they're just, I'm going for that. And they, they don't think, oh, okay, if food is, I, this happens all the time when I was studying them. You know, there'd be food in a garbage can. They get in the garbage can, the lid would fall down, and they wouldn't know how to get out because they never thought that through. Or you see them on the news, you, you'll see, oh, there's a raccoon on the side of a building or up on top of a crane because... And, and they call me, the news people call me, and they're like, why is it doing this? Like, because it didn't think it through. It was like, here's a thing, I'm going to climb it, and maybe there's food there. And then they get to the top, and they go, oh, that was a bad decision, because they don't think it through. So consequences are not, not big for raccoons. They don't, um, yeah, that's well, we, all I can We can assume that they live a happier life up until that moment, though, because ignorance is bliss. Um, for sure. Yeah. Yes, no, they're they're completely contented with it. It's not like they're going, gee, I wish I had more prefrontal cortex so I could think this through. They're they're absolutely happy living in their little world, but it does lead them into some difficult situations. So when we call them trash pandas, it's not too far off. It's not derogatory. It's quite no, not at all. No, <laughs> I, I mean, pandas are not well known for their intelligence either. But, right? <laughs> you know, raccoons are very. Um, they're like. They're very hyperactive and they're very like grabby and bitey and yeah. got to do stuff. And they're, they, they, you don't, you see the ones on TikTok that are sitting around eating popcorn, watching TV, right? Well, of course they're doing that. But the average raccoon, out, wild raccoon, is looking for food all the time. It's always out there, it's always doing stuff. Always, 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 always on the move, looking for things. So very active animals. Yeah. So what is the misconceptions? People in Russia, people in Japan throughout the, some people get the idea that they make good pets. And yes. uh, why, why is that not a good idea? If I'm, and if I find a raccoon in the wild, what's, what's, what's the protocol? Oh yeah. Back away. Just go, <laughs> oh, look how cute a raccoon. And then back away. Also, it's coming out at night, so you shouldn't probably be there, but um, yeah, no, it's a bad idea. Um, uh Generally, people in other countries that see them, see them, see the media, well, they only see the media portrayal of them with, oh, look at this cute thing. Isn't it adorable? He's so funny. He looks like a little human. Look at him. Whatever. Um, I get it. They're adorable. I watch those YouTube videos. I watch the TikToks. <laughs> but, um, you know, just be, I think that elephants and tigers are adorable. I don't want them in my house either. So you don't want a raccoon in your house. But people import them. They are native to North America. They are endemic to North America. They are not evolved anywhere else. Unfortunately, they are exceedingly adaptable. Oops. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're still there. Okay, good. Guess gone. Uh, it's trying to update in the background. Uh, so they're exceedingly adaptable and they are being imported into these countries that have similar climates to where they evolved. So Germany and Russia and Japan and South Korea has raccoon cafes now. Um, so these are places that they're going to arrive. People are going to have them in their houses. I get calls all the time in South Korea in particular. You know, somebody gets a baby raccoon. How adorable. Okay. And then three months later, the baby raccoon is not a baby raccoon and is you know, destroying the family's two bedroom apartment and they don't know what to do with it. So they let it go. And then when they let them go, they go into the parks and then they eat all the eggs of all the birds and they eat everything that's there and they can decimate a city that is not prepared for raccoons. That is not evolved with raccoons. And so that has happened in Japan. Um, and I, talked to folks from Tokyo, a, a newspaper from Japan, and they said, oh, raccoons have been seen in Tokyo now in the garbage cans. I'm like, well, run. Like, this is bad. Don't think this is a door. Because they're like, isn't that cute? No, not cute. You're going to have hundreds of thousands of raccoons. 
every native species you have is going to be gone because these these things will eat everything you got. And you, Tokyo, I imagine, has quite a few garbage cans that are not raccoon proof. So this is not a good thing. So I tell the, the poor guy who came to interview me, he's like, oh, well, I, I was trying to do a nice human interest story. I'm like, it's a disaster. What are you what are you even thinking? How can this be adorable? Like, this is not adorable. They're right. not supposed to be there, and yet they're there, and they're doing very well. As you know, in Germany, they do very well, because the climate's very similar to yeah. where they are from. And do you, uh, do you give us a, a brief background about how they got here? Do you remember how they got here in Germany? I have no idea. Actually, I, I used to at one point know, but how did they get there? Well, it, was, it happened in World War II. The Nazis decided that it would be a good idea to import them a couple. And there also were like fur farms in the near, yeah. but they came from North America and they, they got here. Um, but at one point, the Nazis specifically said, we're going to introduce it to like spice it up in the forests of Germany as far as biodiversity. They, they thought it would be a good idea. Um, you know, people were making all kinds of funny decisions in those days. Um, and it ended up just going absolutely crazy. So in the near from where I live, it, there's a university town called Castle. They have just done extremely well with their what with their fur coats and their omnivore kind of attitude. They they yeah. just yeah you, I see that they're highly adaptable. And I just saw one out in the tree a few months ago, and I got close. I wanted to see him, but I was also very cautious because with the hands and the thumbs and stuff. I just yeah, they don't have opposable thumbs, so they can't grasp like a monkey, but they can grab things really well, and they will grab you, and they will bite you, and they and you will need a rabies shot. So, Oof. you know, you don't want to get close to them. Anyway, yeah, no, it's not good. And that the problem, I mean, there are many problems with climate change. Obviously, the human work were doomed, but one of the <laughs> many, problems, many problems with climate change is that there are more temperate areas now. So, uh, you know, the... As we as it warms up, raccoons will be able to access areas that they never were were able to colonize before. So mm. the world is going to become the raccoon playground, really. And it's it's really not. Uh, and everyone's like, oh, I'd love to live in that world. No, no, <laughs> no. You just think you would. But you really, really wouldn't want to live in that world. Um, I live in that world in Toronto where raccoons are everywhere. And I love this world, but that's where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be in this continent. They're not supposed to be in the other continents where none of the wildlife has evolved any defenses against them. They will not survive. Raccoons will prevail. They are the, amazing. The misconception, be, because they're cute, they're closer to the dog that, you know, is a friend of yours rather than what they actually are, which is like more like a rat that you should probably stay away from. Yeah, well, they're carnivores, right? So, you know, if we had wolves that were being reintroduced everywhere that they are not supposed to be, I don't think, think people would be like, oh, well, that sounds so cute. No, that's not cute. That's not cute. That's disrupting the ecosystem by bringing in, this is a medium-sized carnivore, better analogy is coyotes, I guess, or mm. coyotes, however you want to say them. Um, you know, it's a medium-sized carnivore that will eat everything because it's a carnivore in terms of a scientific classification, but it's an omnivore in terms of what it eats. So that means it eats absolutely everything. And that's why humans, I think, like raccoons because they eat all the things that we eat. They love chips and they love, you know, take out food and they love hamburgers and they they love everything that we love they would they live on high fat diets high sugar all the good uh, things they love all those things I, and yeah so we like that we think it's funny and cute but i've seen videos of the people feeding them marshmallows and i just want to slap humanity um, for don't turn them into us that's the wrong thing too late. <laughs> There's an interesting study looking at um, uh, hypoglycemia in raccoons. So the raccoons in Toronto are severely hypoglycemic. And if they didn't die after a couple of years because they don't live that long in, in the wild, they'd all be diabetic. So, you know, it, it's really they have a high fat, high sugar diet in the city. And that is a problem. Um, they're supposed to live in in wild areas 
one raccoon for many, many kilometers around, no social interactions. They're supposed to be, you know, creatures of the night that go out and they forage and kind of fit right into the ecosystem. But the cities have, they've adapted so well that they've changed their social behavior. They live in groups now, never did that before. Um, hmm. They can they can exploit everything. They have those little hands. They can get into everything. It makes them perfect. Their Their hands evolved to help them live by rivers, the riverine species, that's where they evolve. But man, they can just get into anything. And you know that in Germany, like they get into the attics, they can get into the, you know, they pull the shingles off of roofs, they can do anything with those little hands. So they're they're just a perfect little urban warrior and they're coming to a town near you everywhere (laughs) because they are, they have been introduced. And in Japan, they've wrecked, you know, monasteries and all sorts of um, temples because, you know, they're Buddhist temples. Nobody wants to kill anything. The birds are supposed to, everyone lives in harmony with nature, except the raccoons come in and then they just eat everything. And so the monks who are, who are sworn not to kill anything, they're like, how do we get rid of these things? (laughs) We got to get rid of these things. These things are terrible. Yeah. So, you know, anyway, I I, yeah, I am secretly, I secretly admire them because I think oh, that's amazing that they can adapt. Sure, but, sure. But really, you know, they're not endangered in any way. So you really don't want to introduce them any more places. I had the same feel. Like I, I lived in the country and so I knew the difference between, you know, it's a cute animal and then it's like too many cute animals all at once. And then I saw, you know, I was on the internet, saw a guy building a mouse trap, and I, the vegan animal rights part of myself just gets mad. I go... Look at this scumbag. He wants to hurt these mice. And then he puts it out at night. And there's literally like 50, 60 mice all going in. I go, okay, okay. He's got a problem. Okay. Um, but yeah, do you think that anthropomorphizing these animals is doing more harm than good? Should we, sh- uh, and, and do we even have a chance at, uh, uh, you know, as humans trying to manipulate the balance of biodiversity? Or do you think that's a fool's errand? I think it's very difficult. I think it's very expensive. It's very, in terms of money, time, labor, effort. And I'm not sure that it is worth it. In terms, like in raccoons, I mean, I think the genie's out of the bottle on that one. There's no way that we're getting that back in. But, um, you know, nature has a way. So what we find here in Toronto, where we have a very high density of raccoons, I'll just use them as an example, um, you know, we have cycles of canine distemper that go through the population and kill out, kill large, large numbers of the population. So when densities get high for humans and or and or raccoons or any other species, nature has a way of making sure that it's it's, uh, it's kept in check. So I think that, I mean, that's awful to think that that has to happen, but it does have to happen, and it does. And people are here are obviously super upset it's terrible to watch an animal suffer um, with canine distemper there's no cure so you know we call animal services and they come and they'll euthanize the animals in a very humane way and put them out of their misery Um, but it does reduce the population so when populations get when they explode that's what happens is disease disease will transmit and that's what's happened to raccoons because they're living in higher densities than they should be um, and when they live in high densities, they transmit disease. So, um, and and they get run over by cars. So, you know, those I hate that. I hate that. But um, yeah, I mean, that's what happens. Either they evolve to adapt, do they adapt, or they get killed. Yeah. And it's. Um, I mean, it's, it's a shame. Like, well, the fittest, isn't it? But I but, guess. You, but now, when 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 one species has cars that can go ninety miles an hour and get just wipe out a, a animal, that's kind that's, of playing unfair, that, isn't yeah. it? It is unfair, and that's those ones. They kill me. Those ones that are, you know, those ones that are preventable. That that it's just the worst. I, I hate it. Mm. But you know, the disease is like okay. Well, it's naturally occurring. It comes from dogs. You know, disease travels through our population as well. Okay, that one we can't do very much about, but yeah, the cars is terrible. What we found in Toronto is though that the raccoons, um, after many hundreds of generations here in the city, because they've been here since the 1800s, or well, they've been here since the beginning of time, but the city has been here since the 1800s, built up around them. Um, the ones that learn not to cross major roads um, will live, and they pass that 
smart. The smarts, not that particular information, but they pass the smarts on to their offspring. Um, and so what we found when we put um, GPS collars on raccoons is we found that they um, don't cross major roads. So their territories are within. So we have like some very big thoroughfares here in the city and they don't ever go across those roads. And I was talking to cab drivers. I tend to talk to Uber drivers or cab drivers and ask them, you know, are you driving late at night? Do you see raccoons? And they say, no, hardly ever see them cross the roads at night. But if they do, they usually cross about 4 a.m. when the traffic is the lightest. So they learn, you know, the ones that are still here have learned how to work around our schedules and reduce their chance to get hit. Of course, every year babies are born and they don't know. So <laughs> they get hit. But, um, you know, we're making them smarter. Because yeah. if the ones that will figure us out are smarter. And that's the problem is that they're going to figure it. I mean, the ones in Germany have obviously had many generations to figure out that yeah. system as well. So and you know, you, you studied a lot about uh, the fact that they came from the country. And then as soon as they came to the city, they became really smart because we're basically giving them puzzles to work on all day long. All day long. And, and we also give them food, right? So the ones in the country just don't have the time to spend to do other, much other than look for food. Um, that's what they're doing. But the ones here are so fat and so uh, they, they really, they're in a very small territory. They don't have far to go. They don't get a lot of exercise. They get a lot of food. They have a lot of time on their hands. So it's like us, you know, we watch Netflix. We got to fill up the time right. and that's what they're doing. So if we give them something to work on, I've had a raccoon, work on up on um, trying to get into a, a garbage can that I had a, as a test for eight hours. Like, okay, a wild raccoon, not in the city, would tries that for like five minutes and is like, look, I got to go. I got things to do. I got to <laughs> find some food. I can't be wasting my time. Where big fat females just like, all right, you know, let's just, let's just take a look at this thing. And <laughs> she has the time. She's nothing else to do. That's the scary thing. When they get integrated, then they'll become as smart as us, and then they become a, an issue for us. Like, I saw one yesterday on the subway wearing a hat. <laughs> 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 on his way to work, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Did it have a little briefcase? That would be yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Asked me what. <laughs> he said, do you have the time? I said, I don't have the time. I'm sorry. That's the thing about raccoons. They never care about the time. They're always late. They're never on time. They See, this is, this is why we should be looking up to them rather than looking down to them, right? Oh, yeah. No, I think there's lots of people who, people here in, in Toronto are, you know, it's, they're kind of our unofficial mascot and people are, I mean, they're on t-shirts, they're on everything. So I think there's a lot of people who look up to them who actually, and I see that, I said that years ago, it's like, well, you know, they'll be our, our overlords eventually. And they said something about Uber <laughs> raccoons and everyone's like, I welcome the raccoon overlords. People say that to me all the time. Oh, like, yeah. oh, okay. Well, really, we have much bigger brains. We can figure it out. It's okay. We have all this cortex there. They don't have that. We can win. We will win. So, you know. I, I hopefully the humans will prevail, but if yeah, not, we'll see. Well, the I'm great sure. the great raccoon wars of twenty fifty. Yeah. Uh, oh, maybe more twenty thirty. I don't know. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't be a bad way to go. I don't. I just don't yeah, want to get hit by a car. Yeah, it'd be fine. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can just hand it over to them. They'll be okay. Well, thirty minutes. Come back and do this again. This was really a lot of fun, and I know that you endless. Uh, you know wealth of information so come back and do it again you bet that was really fun thank you I, uh, yeah it's always funny i now i'm gonna think of a raccoon and a hat in the subway so <laughs> <laughs> all right i'll give an outro and then we'll talk after this okay suzanne mcdonald professor of psychology york university wonderful human being uh animal <laughs> lover animal expert cool human being anything, <laughs> anything you want to add before we go no just thanks this is fun it's always fun to talk about animals all right. Uh, well, wave goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye.